literature for most of us tends to only come in the form of books. You know, it's written, it's text, it's pages. It's so recognizable only in the form of a book. And for me, literature is the spoken, the sung, the stories that we tell around a fire. Team Akad's podcast, ladies and gentlemen. This is where we try and uh, figure out the thoughts that animate the actions of those who create the art. Uh, and of course, um, we've got the wonderful Janice Parriott with us. Um, everything the light touches is just uh, such a wonderful light uh, touch on the on the conscience that makes us think as well, which is wonderful. I mean, the uh, the felicity with words and the uh, and the thoughts of those stories is absolutely wonderful. So thank you very much for giving that to us. Well, I'm delighted to be here uh -huh. and thank you for your lovely words about my book. Uh, I, of course, um, uh, you know, uh, became a much bigger fan uh, of your work after having seen that fantastic Instagram series that you put up of, uh, uh, of writing desks. Mm -hmm. uh, it was absolutely brilliant because uh, one tends to forget uh, how beautiful the process of writing can be mm. uh, visually as, mm. <laughs> as well. Mm. Uh, where did that thought come from and how, how did that uh, Instagram series happen? So the series you mentioned is called Where We Write uh, or hashtag Where We Write. <laughs> of course. And um, it grew out of um, that strange, strange time at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, at the beginning of the first lockdown, because I believe we've had quite a few, although everything blurs in my head now and sure. I don't know where one began and what, where one ended. Um, but this was the first lockdown and it forced the world indoors, where of course people were lucky enough to have an indoors to begin with. Um, and I think so many of the divisions that we'd created for ourselves, home and work, personal and public, family and individual, all of these lines began to blur, they began to collapse. Suddenly, we were all home um, with whoever else you know, around us, families, partners, pets. Sometimes we were on our own as well. Um, and I think um, what drew me was where did people retreat to um, within this space of sudden chaos, really? Sure. There was quiet and calm outside because, you know, there was no traffic and no one could move. But what about the interiors? Where did people find some kind of sense of self? Or how did they create that new kind of sense of self uh, at this time? And I felt that for me, it was my writing space, my writing desk. Uh, it was the place that I could go to, to think, to write, to wonder what on earth was going on at that point. And I figured that there would be others for whom this space really mattered as well. And it was this incredible collaborative exercise of people sharing pictures from all around the world of their spaces that they wrote at, thought at, retreated to whether they were a dining space, you know, a little spot on their dining table, sure. um, a little corner somewhere that they created in, you know, in a corridor, in a room. Some of these spaces hadn't existed before. Sure. And suddenly we needed them. And I think the, the intimacy of it was, you know, the, the, there was a faintly voyeuristic touch to the intimacy of, of it course, as well, wasn't there? Of course. Um, but what's your writing environment like? I mean, do you, uh, do you tend to lock yourself away in a corner? Do you have a place where you go to to write and all? Well, I am lucky enough to have um, a, a study space to which I retreat for precisely this. And because I live between Delhi and Shillong, which is home mostly, um, I have two separate study spaces, but which, oddly enough, look quite similar in terms of what's on the table. I tend to collect things like a little magpie, um, little stones and acorns and um, shells and just little bits that, you know, I come across on a forest walk or um, on, a, on a journey. Um, and I collect these things and I usually also have a plant on my writing table because it helps remind me that my writing 
um, ought to be as organic and as structured in form as a plant. Um, sure. And so it serves to help me look at, at something that's growing and living as I'm writing something that I hope is also growing and living. Of course. And then there's the external environment. You come from uh, one of the most beautiful parts of the country and uh, uh, sadly one of the more neglected as well. Uh, but there's suddenly renewed interest in the Northeast. Everyone's talking about the Northeast, not just the um, geographical beauty of it, but the, but the historical aspects as well. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there are... Um, uh, there are ideas being attributed to uh, uh, to that. There's also, uh, dare I say it, a little bit of a, politic a politicization, politicization <laughs> as yes. well. One tends to trip on this word <laughs> a oh lot God, more nowadays. So what, long, what, yes. <laughs> what are your views on that? Hmm, I mean, I think in terms of literature, because that's sort of the space that I, sure? I, I deal with um, on a more uh, regular basis, shall we say, um, you know, I know that there seems to be this renewed um, feeling that, oh, there's more writing coming from the Northeast. We have more writers coming from the Northeast. We're publishing more writers from the Northeast, which is all well and good. There's absolutely sort of nothing uh, to complain about on that front. But I'm slightly uh, wary or tentative about how this tends to overlook the fact that the region that I come from um, is vibrantly alive with yes. an incredible array of oral storytelling traditions. Sure. Um, and how literature, for most of us, tends to only come in the form of books. You know, it's of written, course. it's text, it's pages. It's so recognizable only in the form of a book. And for me, literature is the spoken the sung, the stories that we tell around a fire. Um, and I think that I wish that, that there was more of an acknowledgement of that, that we have always had storytellers in the Northeast. You just haven't known where to look and who to look for. And that's the thing. I mean, you come from uh, what is literally the home of Indian blues. <laughs> Shillong uh, happens to be a place that has given us uh, Rudy Walong on the guitar mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> and Soulmate and yes, Mojo. And it's unsurprising, right? It's, unsurprising. it's a place where we've had centuries of, of, yes. of, of really deeply, um, you know, profound oral storytelling traditions. And so this shift to music, to poetry is quite a natural one. For sure. And uh, there's also the, the, the Shillong Chamber Choir mm -hmm. who did such a wonderful, wonderful job of uh, actually popularizing uh, one of the epics of Meghalaya, yes. uh, uh, you know, into um, into such a beautiful uh, 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 operatic yes. uh, rendition. Yes. Uh, do you sometimes, but uh, you know, I have to ask you, do you feel compelled to tell those stories uh, in your own way as well, considering where you come from and, yeah. and how little people know of them? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it's also a very tricky question because I feel as though while I am deeply rooted to where I come from, um, back home, the hills of Meghalaya, um, I also wish to be untethered. It's a tussle, I guess, this kind of strange duality that you wish to be anchored and also free. Um, because I wish as a writer to be unpoliced in where I wander. Um, I want to follow stories wherever they may come from and wherever they may go. I want to live in a literary landscape where I don't need visas and passports and where I don't need to justify why I wish to cross a certain border. You but know? does that history become a little bit of a burden? Do you ever question yourself whether you're not fulfilling the responsibility? Yeah. Unfortunately, there's there's this whole thing about yeah. coming from places there yeah. where the stories need to be told. Yeah. Is that Does that ever feel like a burden to you? Do yeah. you ever feel conflicted about that? I think that's uh, a pressure that I've felt not only from the outside. So, of course, there's the expectations of readers, your community, publishers, editors. Um, that you will write those stories because you come from that particular place. But also there's the internal pressure that yeah. you're speaking mm -hmm. about, about how you feel as though you have a duty, a responsibility to do this, to be the voice of your people in some exactly. way. Exactly. And I think um, I've struggled and I've um, worked really to, in some ways, lighten myself off those burdens. Um, not because I don't care, 
enough or I don't wish to have those histories told, but I feel as though it needs to be an organic process, that I will revisit those stories, those histories, those landscapes in a way that is organic for me and meaningful for me. So if a story demands uh, an exploration of a hidden history, that's when it will come in. Not sure. because I absolutely feel that I desire to do this because otherwise I will be filled with guilt. Sure. You know? uh, which of course leads me to uh, this question that I've uh, asked a lot of people who've been on the podcast, mm -hmm. which is about uh, the responsibility of art. Mm -hmm. You know, now we've, we've had two very distinct uh, thought processes. One was that art should be unfettered, untethered. Um, and if the responsibility comes in naturally, that's fine. But it should not be burdened with the onus of responsibility. The other is that if you're actually putting out a story out there, uh, there is a responsibility for that story to mean something, mm. to reflect things. Mm. Uh, what are your views on, on the responsibility of That's art? also a tricky one and it always takes me back to this little story um, about Beckett, uh, the playwright, of course. Um, who was in Paris during the Second World War and he was part of the resistance. He, his friends, um, you know, they were comrades, they were fighting um, the Nazis and he was requested by a lot of his friends to write a play, to produce a work of art that would help the resistance, that would be pro-resistance and he refused um, and he didn't justify his actions at all, he just refused and of course there were different camps, there were people who condemned him, who said you know it is his duty to do this and there were people who said well hang on a minute, is it really? What is the responsibility of an artist to be true to themselves, perhaps, right, in some way? Um, and I think that I understand where Beckett comes from in some strange way, um, because I think that your duty is to tell the stories that are closest to you. And in the telling of those stories, there will emerge some kind of larger thematic issue that you share with the world. I mean, in all my writing, no matter how varied it's been, from short stories to a novel, to a novella, to a big tome of a book, um, I think what connects all of these books is this desire at the heart of them all to question categories. And it stems from myself, my own body, I, I don't look like I come from anywhere really because I have such a mixed heritage that if you ask me, Janice, where are you from? I have no idea what, what to tell you. My DNA mapping lights up the whole world, <laughs> right? Um, and so if I've felt that in my body, if I've felt that in myself, it translates into the writing that I do and in that way, extends itself into the larger world. Sure. I think your duty is to tell the stories that are closest and most meaningful to you and in that they will be meaningful. Sure, there's also this, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the world of social media, there's mm. uh, opinions that abound. Uh, there are also sometimes, um, uh, you know, thoughts that get attributed that might, might not be the thoughts that you want to sort of, uh, you know, put across in your uh, in your ideas. Uh, is there second guessing? Uh, do you do you, do you second guess? Do you look again at the subjects that you're choosing in this world that is being increasingly described as, you know, growing inward, mm. uh, getting a little. Uh, harder in its mm. stances, etc. Mm. Uh, does that affect the way you choose your topics for writing? Um, do you mean in terms of my books or in terms of, of, of an Instagram? You are actually quite eclectic in your <laughs> in your writing. I mean, <laughs> everything from uh, the caravan to GQ to... Yes, <laughs> um, yes. Like I said, you know, just follow where the story takes me and where my so are you picking? Takes me. Are, you, are you picking and choosing topics a little more carefully nowadays? I think it's not so much about me picking the topic as much as the topic picking me. Something right. becomes imperative, something becomes urgent because it becomes part of my experience of sure. being in the world. And, and that is what I wish to explore and that is what I wish to write about and that is what I wish to spend time on. Sure. Um, because otherwise it just becomes in some way entirely external. It becomes a thing that is just plucked out of nowhere with no context and no work of art grows in a vacuum. Sure. There's sure. always a complicated, deep context from which writing and, 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 and visual art and, and films grow out of, sure. emerge from. 
there's of course the poems and the, and the books to read as well to just prove that um, mm. uh, and of course since we are talking about social media finally um, uh, you know uh, a listicle from you of uh, three oh. to five things uh, that you'd like people to either remember or forget when they're taking their first tentative steps uh, uh, in the world of the word oh my i mean i would actually have a list of one thing only um which is if that makes the list <laughs> at all um but i would um i would offer that um if you're trying to write and you're struggling to write and you don't quite know whether you should be writing at all um it helps to remember sometimes that no one else can tell the story that you're trying to tell nobody else in the planet nobody else in the world and that makes you really just the most appropriate the best candidate to tell your story that's important to remember you are the best candidate to tell your own story and janis of course has told has told that story beautifully uh, in everything the light touches this has been absolutely wonderful janis thank you ever so much for your time such joy thank you team of guys podcast ladies and gentlemen <laughs> if you uh, heard it's important that you then go on to chew on those thoughts a little because that's always a nice idea first step to thoughts uh team podcast podcast what will come up next ah, you'll just have to follow our social media handles to know that won't you thank you for watching if you've enjoyed this podcast subscribe to our channel now we have a new episode out every friday